Well, that was interesting. It's kind of strange, but it, it was it was interesting. We'll see. Well, welcome to another one of my YouTube lecture videos. This is period four, 1800 to 1848. Here we're going to look at Jefferson and the Constitution. Now, what we're doing here in this video, remember, it's mostly about content, because if you're in my class, you know we're going to use this to help us to learn how to write short answers. So you need this video for your content. Those of you who are not in my class, well, this is also good for content. It's going to be a really good one. I am going to also have two different key concepts that we'll utilize as well. Let's get into the lecture here. So our first key concept, 4.1, Roman numeral 1, letter A. So here we see again in the early 1800s. So Jefferson has won the election of 1800, and his party is going to basically dominate now. It'll be Jefferson, and it's going to be Madison, and then it's going to be James Monroe. Right? They're going to dominate this early part of the 1800s. But political parties are still there. You have Jefferson's Republican Party. You still have the Federalist, but they are slowly falling apart. But they're still debating over tariffs. And basically in this lecture, we're going to talk about the power of the federal government and how Jefferson uses that power. Right? So that's, that's part of the concept that we're going to focus on in this video log. We're going to have some, I'm going to have another one here in a few days, the War of 1812. And we're going to look at this part about European powers. But for right now, we're focusing on this little part here, the power of the federal government. And again, to give you a heads up, we're practicing short answers, how to write them. Well, remember, the very you have four short answers. You're going to have to do number one. Number one is always going to be on the skill, disciplinary skill, historical disciplinary, secondary sources, historian's argument. So in that first question, you're always going to get two historians talking about the same subject. So I'm going to utilize what we're doing here in this in this video so you can have that outside information to help write that short answer. Question two, you have to answer. Question three and four, you get to choose which one you want to do. But both of those, or all three of them, use the reasoning skill two, which is comparison, and three, causation. So here are these skills that we have to learn in class to write the short answers. You're going to utilize the content here from the video to help you do it. Let's get into the video. Jefferson and the Constitution. Look at that. I gave him some glasses there. Look at that. That's for you, Max. I think you're the one asking me for some memes. and uh, So maybe later on I'll put a, some different memes on here too. So we'll see. We'll see. All right, so Jefferson in strict or loose? Does he view the Constitution strictly? Does he view it loosely? Hmm, okay. Let's wait and see if someone can come up with the answer. Some of you are sitting here right now thinking, I don't know what he's talking about. So others are you yelling, I know, I know, I know, I know. Especially those who sit in the front row, you know who you are. You're always answering those questions. Yes, strict, strict. He's a strict constructionist. There you go. Strict constructionist. But here's the thing. If you're going to write that Jefferson is a strict constructionist, you've got to be able to tell me why is he a strict constructionist. I'm not going to tell you that one here in the video. Go back in your notes. Think about who Jefferson is. Think about how he views government. Think about, oh, I don't know, certain resolutions he came up with when John Adams was president. Maybe there's a hint there for you. Why is he a strict constructionist? If we were to write a DBQ and you wanted to do point of view and you got a document on Jefferson and you want to write Jefferson is a strict constructionist. No, that tells me what he is. That's not his point of view. You have to be able to tell me why. What is it that makes it his point of view as to why he wants to do this? Also, do you always have to stick to your ethical stance? Are there times you're allowed to change your opinion? Is it proper when you do it? Could it be proper? Obviously, I'm setting you up for something about Jefferson and his view of the Constitution. But we'll get to that in a few moments. I do want to mention here real quick about this thing called party patronage. If you remember, Jefferson has a political party. Your key concepts call it the Democratic Republicans. In all honesty, it was just known as the Republican Party, but that's okay. We'll call it Democratic-Republican to make it easy for people. 
He has had a very bitter, angry type of an election in 1800. That's the first real, you know, uh, opposing thoughts, real fighting each other, name-calling type of election in our history, the 1800 one. He ran for the second time against John Adams. He lost in 96. Now he wins in 1800. But he's got to heal the nation. And he famously says, we're all Republicans. We're all Federalists. Or in that very soft, southern, lithy kind of a voice, we're all Republicans. We're all Federalists. Because right, he had a little bit of lith. All right, well, enough of that. Enough of that. So Jefferson coming into office is going to choose not to try to just fire everyone that's a Federalist from a job. Some will lose their jobs, but not everybody. But jobs in government become very, very important. Think about your political parties. In fact, I'm going to remind you about something we've already studied. James Madison, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers, wrote Federalist Number 10 that dealt with factions. Factions eventually become political parties. He hypothesized the thought, how can you control a faction? Get rid of its liberty. Well, we don't want to do that. Give everyone the same opinion. That's impossible. So you can't, you cannot control factions, really. You, you, are, I'm so, you can't stop the causes of factions. You can only control the effect of a faction. But that's an interesting thought. You can't give everyone the same opinion. As factions become political parties, nobody's in a political party. Think of the millions of people who are in a political party. They all have different reasons for being there. How do you keep them loyal? How do you keep those people who all have a different reason to vote for this president or for a governor that's in your political party or a member of the House of Representatives that's in your political party? How do you keep them loyal? Well, the thought was what's known as party patronage. Patronage is jobs, federal jobs. You have somebody who lives in Tennessee and they're going to help you get elected. They're going to help run a campaign on your behalf to get a governor elected, someone in the House, or even the President of the United States. Well, to keep that guy loyal, who in turn will keep everyone in his district loyal for your party, we're going to reward him with a government job, party patronage. That's how you kept people loyal. Now, it worked really well in the early 1800s. By the time we get to the Civil War, it's starting to become corrupt. By the time we get out of the Civil War into what's known as the Gilded Age, it's going to be very corrupt. And eventually, we'll talk about this, they'll eventually get rid of party patronage. But for right now, think about how it keeps people loyal. If you were to write, say you want to write something about Jefferson's time period, party patronage was a way of keeping people loyal by giving them jobs. All right, and we'll talk more about that in class to clarify it a little bit more. All right, so here we are. 4.3. Yeah, this is one of the ones where they could not keep these chronologically in order because there's particular reasons why this one is in 4.3, but here it is. 4.3, Roman number one, letter A, the Louisiana Purchase. All right, now, here you're going to have to listen to me, and you might have to stop and go back. You can also go to something called um, your textbook. I know. You don't want to read the textbook. Of course. Why would I even say that? But you should. All right. So the Louisiana Purchase. When Jefferson becomes president, the United States was from the Atlantic Ocean, to the Mississippi, right? He knows that France is an issue. At this time period, France owns the Louisiana Territory. They own this. Jefferson is getting very concerned. Napoleon is talking about creating a, a, a breadbasket for his empire and start putting troops here in Louisiana. The United States greatly needs the Mississippi River and the Port of Orleans, New Orleans, for trade. They will send people to France to see if they can buy 
not the city of New Orleans, but just parts of it for ports. And they're going to offer something around $10 million. When they get to France, Napoleon is cash strapped. He needs money. He's fighting a war with Great Britain, and he it's a very costly war. He just had a deal with a revolution in Haiti that he lost. He lost the revolution in Haiti. The only successful slave revolution in the history of the world is here in Haiti. So he's lost troops. He's lost money. When these diplomats get there, the French float out the idea that for $15 million, you can buy all of Louisiana. Not just little port part of New Orleans, but all of Louisiana. $15 million. That's 15 cents an acre. What's, you've seen the, have you seen the commercial now, the Capital One commercial, <laughs> where they show Jefferson with the phone? Gentlemen! The Louisiana Purchase is now ours. Ha, 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 ha. You know, what's in your wallet? Um, yes, 15 million, 15 cents an acre. This is a deal you cannot pass up. But is it constitutional? Is it constitutional for the President of the United States to negotiate a treaty to purchase land? Technically, no. Only Congress can really do this. Now, it is constitutional that the president can go into certain agreements with countries. Jefferson has his first major constitutional crisis of conscience. He starts wondering if maybe we should get an amendment to the Constitution that allow him to purchase this. But an amendment takes time. Napoleon is an emperor who is crazy. If I give him time, he's going to back out of the deal. He's going to realize that he's, this is a bad deal on his part. Thankfully, one of the ministers in France is James Monroe, who will eventually become president himself. James Monroe just basically took the deal without getting any congressional approval. He just, he just agreed to it. And then they had to basically convince Jefferson this was a good deal. Which Jefferson, again, I'm not going to go, there's a, there's a lot we can talk about just this here but he is going to go ahead and purchase this. Now think about it. He's a strict constructionist, but he used loose construction of the Constitution of the President's power in order to buy this. He hated Alexander Hamilton's bank. He hated his financial system, but he's gonna use the bank and Hamilton's financial system to purchase Louisiana. He's also gonna use the bank to help him start to go out here and explore this area. So here's now Jefferson becoming president, and he begins to realize there are times where a president, for the good of a country, has to do things a little bit more loose than strict. Now, who do you think immediately began to yell and point fingers saying, you can't do this? You can't say Alexander Hamilton because he's, he's, unfortunately, he's going to be well, no, I guess in 1803, he's still alive. 1804, he's shot. But yes, it's going to be Hamilton and his Federalists who are going to be attacking him. Um, but he doesn't care. Jefferson doesn't care. And you know what? America's going to love this. You doubled the size of America overnight. You did it for 15 cents an acre. 15 cents! He's going to easily win his re-election in 1804. America loves him for this. This was a really good thing that he does. Now, something else here. Now let's go back to 4.1, Roman numeral 1, but this time letter B. Here we're introduced to the Supreme Court. It's in the concept, right? The decisions established the primacy of the judiciary. Well, it doesn't mention the Supreme Court case by name, but that Supreme Court case is so important. It's Mulberry versus Madison. Right? This is a very, very important moment for, for Jefferson, but more so for the Supreme Court. All right? And again, to kind of make this easy for you. Remember, we talked about this in class. You have the election of 1800 takes place. 
Jefferson wins. November is the election. But the Republicans didn't just win the White House. They didn't just win the executive branch. They won the House of Representatives. They won many state governor races. And remember, senators are not elected, they're appointed, but there were senators that were up, their seats were up, and when governors switched from Federalists to Jeffersonians, those senators changed as well. But when do you take your oaths of office during that time period? Today it's in January. In their time period, it's going to be March. So November, December, January, February, March. You have four months where you're still the President of the United States. John Adams is still the President for four months. The members of the House, the members of the Senate are still there for four months. And the Federalists dominated at that time. They've lost everything. Come March of 1801, they're all gone. In the meantime, if you remember, Jefferson didn't outright, outright win the election. He ties an electoral college with Aaron Burr. So now that becomes a big deal. It's not until February that Jefferson finally actually wins the election. So the Federals took advantage of all this confusion in January, and they passed a law, the Judiciary Act of 1801. We've lost the executive branch. We've lost the legislative branch. The only thing left to us is the judiciary branch. They passed the law that increased the number of federal judges at every level, local, district level, appellate level. With the Supreme Court, John Adams nominates uh, John Marshall to be the new Chief Justice, and that's John Marshall. That's a statue of John Marshall, who happens to be the cousin of Jefferson, and they don't like each other. They're known as the Midnight Judges because John Adams was signing their commissions all the way to the last day of his presidency, all the way up until midnight. So he become the midnight judges. Well, actually, he probably stopped signing commissions sometime around, I don't know, between seven in the evening and nine o'clock in the evening. But it's not as, you know, poetic to go, you know, the 845 judges, just before I went to bed around nine o'clock at night, judges. That, there's no ring to that. But to go the midnight judges, that's mysterious, that's ominous. Ooh. All right, enough of that. So Jefferson takes his oath of office in March, and it's only then that he and his new Secretary of State, James Madison, find out about these midnight judges. And Jefferson decides, as president, he doesn't have to honor the Judiciary Act. He is going to pretend like it doesn't exist, and he thinks he's going to have the right, basically, to declare it unconstitutional. Enter a William Mulberry. He shows up at Washington, D.C. He is going to be a judge, but he is going to be a justice of the peace judge, one of the lowest judges you can basically be. When he shows up, he is denied his right to be a judge. He says this is wrong. He immediately petitions to the Supreme Court. Because this is an issue with the President of the United States and the Secretary of State. Weirdly enough, in this time period, the Secretary of State is the one who files these commissions to be judges. James Madison, who refuses to do it. So Mulberry sues the federal government and he sues James Madison, who failed to give him his commission. That's why it's called Mulberry versus Madison. The real issue here, why this Supreme Court case is so important is who gets to actually decide law? Does the President of the United States get, does, is it his power to decide what law is law? Is it Congress who makes the law? Or is it the Supreme Court and the Judiciary Branch? Now again, there are so many moving parts to this case. I'm just trying to make it simple and give you the cliff notes because trust me, I know a lot about this case. Um, in the end, John Marshall does a couple of things that's really quite brilliant here. Because think about it. If he sides with Mulberry, James Madison, as Secretary of State, could be impeached, which then implies the President of the United States, James uh, Thomas Jefferson, who, who oversees Madison, should also then be impeached. So this becomes a big, big deal. 
This is a constitutional crisis moment in our history. John Marshall rules that Marbury had no right to be, bring this case before the Supreme Court, so he throws the case out. Because he says Marbury should have started in the lower courts and worked his way up to the Supreme Court. Marshall could have stopped there, but he doesn't. John Marshall then rules the Judiciary Act of 1801 is in fact unconstitutional. Now you might think, win-win for Thomas Jefferson. Sure, but it's really a win for John Marshall and the Supreme Court. What he's really proving is only the Supreme Court has a right to review law, and only them. Not the president, not Congress. Congress makes the law, then the president executes the law, but if somebody doesn't like the, call, the law, they have a right to sue and bring it to the courts, and then only the court can review the law, and of course the Supreme Court having the final say of law. We call this judicial review. This is that important of a case. We now know, follow me on this, that the idea of checks and balances actually work. That each branch can check the power of each other's branch. If the president didn't like a law that, the, that Congress makes, he can veto it. If Congress doesn't like the fact that that law got vetoed, they can override it with a two-thirds vote. Checks and balances. But what if the Congress makes the law, the president passes the law, but it turns out not to be a very good law and someone wants to sue, well then the courts come in and can rule it unconstitutional. Check their power. How do you check the power of the Supreme Court though? Remember, they're claiming the law is unconstitutional, meaning it's not in the Constitution, you can't do it. So to overrule a Supreme Court decision, you make an amendment to the Constitution. Checks and balances really do work. And that's why this case is so important. Moving on now, we're going back to 411A. Okay, so let's touch upon this last part here with relationships with European powers. Here's what's gonna get Jefferson in a lot of trouble in his second term of office. We have this moment where we have the USS Chesapeake, an American naval ship. Now, I've been talking to you since George Washington that the British have been attacking American merchant ships, ships of trade, and impressing American merchant sailors into the Royal Navy. Well, now they attack an American naval ship, a ship of war. The, the his uh, I think they're called His Majesty's Service, the, the Leopold, which is a British ship, comes up along the side of this American ship and opens fire with its cannon. All right? They fire upon this American ship. They kill American sailors. They then board the ship and they take American naval sailors and impress them into the British Navy. This is an act of war. It's an act of war. And there are people in the country who want Britain to pay for this. They feel like America should declare war and stop this impressment. Now they've gone to the point of attacking American sailors in the Navy and they killed some of them. Jefferson isn't really sure how to act. He doesn't want war with the British. He, he's starting to realize, like George Washington, who he did not agree with, who he didn't like his farewell address, but he begins to realize neutrality isn't such a bad thing. But Jefferson goes a little further, and he declares an embargo act. Embargo. An embargo is where you stop trade. You will not trade with any country. In fact, Jefferson decides... The United States will not trade with any European power because Great Britain and France are both impressing us. In Jefferson's mind, that's going to hurt Europe economically. They need our trade. They need our food. They need our cotton. They need us to trade with them. This will hurt them economically. But it didn't hurt the British or the French. They have their own trading system. They're, they're powerful empires. 
This actually in turn hurt Americans. And the one group of people that get angry the most are the Federalists. The Federalists are the ones who get the most angry. And they create a political cartoon called, Oh, Grab Me. <clears throat> You've got Thomas Jefferson is riding a turtle. Okay. What? A turtle? Yes, a turtle. Uh, if you think about it, um, why, why a turtle? Well, he's from the Maryland, the Chesapeake area. They're known for their terrapin turtles, I think. I kind of think that's what that is. I could be completely wrong, but I've always thought that's probably what that is. And he's snipping at a person here who is illegally smuggling with the British. Because remember, Americans love to smuggle. These are Americans who all went through the... Um, the American Revolution period. They were always smuggling. Uh, so that's why they're doing this. But who would be smuggling with the British? The Federalists are. Federalist merchants are secretively f trying to smuggle here. And Jefferson's embargo won't let them do it. And oh, grab me is embargo spelled backwards. I just blew your mind, didn't I? Think about that again for just a second. Yes, I knew it. This is a very popular political cartoon, by the way. The Embargo Act does hurt America economically, but it's also going to hurt the Federalists politically they are acting in a way like traitors to the government. You don't, you don't have to like a law, but now you're illegally smuggling. This is going to carry over. Obviously, this is 1807, 1808 uh, is an election year. James Madison is going to become the new president in 1808 because Jefferson does his two terms and he's out. But he's going to carry on the um, that same that same principle, he'll, they'll get rid of embargo, but Madison will do his own sort of uh, pseudo-embargo act, and we'll talk about that in class. But it's going to constantly make the Federalists angry, and the Federalists are going to constantly do things that's going to politically kill them, all right? Because they don't want to listen to the government anymore. They're becoming their own worst enemies, as it were. Well, that's it for this lecture. But please, go to pages 220. I'm not going to start all over. I'm 20 minutes into this. Go to pages 212 to 222. And on page 222, question number two, answer all parts of that. That's also part of this reading. And have that ready for class. And there's TJ. Look at him signing the Declaration of Independence. What a cool guy. All right, everybody. All right, stop, 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 stop. There, oof, that was too much. Have a good evening, bye.